Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual book launch of John Hunt's new novel, You Never Really Know. My name is Jennifer Malek. I'm the editor of The Reading List, and we're hosting this launch tonight along with Penguin Random House, South Africa. In conversation with John this evening is Michelle Magwood, award-winning and acclaimed book critic and former contributing books editor of The Sunday Times. Um, our featured author this evening, John Hunt, is the author of the novels The Space Between, The Space Between, and The Boy Who Could Keep a Swan in His Head, which was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Fiction Prize. His nonfiction book, The Art of the Idea, which celebrates the power of ideas to move the world forward, has been translated into several languages. He's currently worldwide creative chair of um, the advertising agency TBWA, having previously co-founded TBWA Hunt Lascaris. He grew up in Hillbrow and still lives and works in Johannesburg. You Never Really Know, which I have here, if it's a very eye-catching cover, um, it's the novel we're launching this evening. Um, it's the story of a young hero, Cappuccino, barista to the president. It's a playful and damning satire of political power filled with warm humor, and it serves up a double shot of pathos as it moves from satire to true tragedy. You Never Really Know is out now from Penguin Random House, South Africa, and it's available for purchase at all good bookstores and probably all good bad bookstores, all good bookstores and all bad bookstores, if there's such a thing as a bad bookstore. Um, it's also available online for the recommended retail price of 280 Rand, but you can probably find it um, for a slightly cheaper price if you scout around, but I mean, it's well worth 200 Rand, so you should buy yourself a copy. If you haven't got a copy yet, you can buy one while the launch is happening. Such are the joys of the world today. Please leave your questions about the book in the comment section wherever you're watching this video on Facebook or on YouTube as John will, have time to some, um, John will have time to answer some of those in the Q&A at the end of the session. So without further ado, let me hand over to Michelle to start the conversation and enjoy the launch. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Welcome um, to our viewers and to you, John. It's very nice to be talking to you again. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that we're talking about your third novel. I mean, you really are, I feel, just going from strength to strength. It's quite. It's a very different novel from the other two that you've written. Um, I also want to say what a wonderful cover this is. Um, it really is. It's uh, designed by an outfit called Publicide. And uh, I really believe in the power of a good cover um, in, in selling books. We'll get to the title a little further, John, um, because it's important. But let, let's go over the story. Let's let's talk about um, the, the outline. Will you outline it for us and uh, talk about the characters? Well, um, perhaps a good place to start is um, why. So I like the idea of writing this book because I've always been intrigued by um, people who are surrounding people in power. And whether it's the, the chef or the, the housemaid or his hairdresser, um, powerful people always treat those people as if they're really shadows. But they there, they see everything very, very close up. And Cappuccino, who's the sort of protagonist of the book, ends up being the barista to probably the most powerful man in Africa. So I guess he does become a, a fairly significant fly on a very significant wall. And he then spends his days observing what happens. And, you know, again, uh, in my experience, very powerful people have a certain way of acting with their entourage. And Cappuccino ends up being in the perfect place behind his fancy coffee machine to watch all sorts of goings on. Um, he falls in love with one of the uh, president's assistants, um, but much of his time is spent watching a developing theme, which, you know, no spoilers, um, drags him ever closer into sort of the clutches of um, probably the most powerful man in Africa. And it's really the story of what he observes as a very, very initially, um, reticent character. Uh, so you see this developing story through a guy who would normally be there, but I think that gives a richness to his observations. Mm. I, I th the book is something of a shapeshifter, I found, because on one in one way, it's a very sharp satire of, of politics, of power and, and corruption. It's a romance, um, and it's 
absolutely gutting in some parts, and then it's also terribly tender in other parts. Um, to talk us through, how did the book come to you originally? Um, it, it's quite interesting because you know, a lot of people have, have used the word satire uh, to describe it, um, which I guess is, is true. But in the context of a world where, say, uh, for example, people are, 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 you know, nearly killed by having their underpants poisoned, um, you know, it's quite difficult to do satire these days because the real world is almost, you know, um, full of it. So the idea came to me wanting not to write a book that's investigative journalism, not wanting to write a book that was just um, a normal novel. And I found the best way through the story was to move it around a little bit. It didn't start off that way, but as I wrote it, it felt um, kind of like the, it, it's real life, although you might call it satire, you might call it romance, you know, ain't that the truth? Isn't in the crazy world we live in today, it seems that you always end up having a little piece of everything in your life and there isn't really a stock standard category anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you remind me of Martin Amos, who called satire a militant irony, which um, also applies to, to your book. Um, so I think to give, in fact, what I also will say, John, is I was reminded over and over again while reading the book, I was reminded of Christopher Hope. Um, I think that, I don't know whether you've read a lot of Christopher yeah. Hope, but um, it was very, you know, it was a reminder of, of his satire. So I think um, I'd like to give the viewers a sense of your writing and of the character of Cappuccino. You and I selected a passage earlier um, that should do the trick. So could you read it for us and put it sure. into context? I'll have to um, stick my glasses on. This is um, Cappuccino talking, and he's trying to give the reader, in a very literal sense, a context of where he works and the environment he works within. So, um, hmm. Right. I stay along with the other servants at the president's unofficial residence. I'm the only one who's lived there all his life. Powerful government people need an unofficial residence so they can do things unofficially. An official doing, unofficially doing things usually means it didn't happen. If people catch you out and prove it did, you can say it didn't really happen because it was, well, unofficial. Unofficial is like abracadabra. You wave the word and everything disappears. The house is huge and is now covered with a thick orange terracotta tiled roof. The Italian ambassador, who was also very complimentary about my macchino, said it reminded him of Tuscany. The master bedroom is, of course, the biggest. It has a TV screen that almost takes up the size of one wall and a gym off to the side. The plastic wrappers are still on the dumbbells and the treadmill hasn't been plugged in yet. However, the sauna and the jacuzzi get used often. Above the headboard, there is a large picture of the president on a white horse. It's in a gold frame and commands your attention. The horse is rearing up on its hind legs, but the president is unworried. He is calmly pointing forward while the wind blows. His red robe blows the, the red robe he's wearing over his black military uniform with white leggings. On his head is a blue and mustard colored hat in the shape of a croissant cut down the middle. It appears as if the stallion has to climb a mountain, yet our president is unafraid and his feet firmly in the stirrups. This picture hypnotized me. I used to take so long to change the sheets because I was always staring at this work of art. It was only after I googled famous pictures of men on horse that I understood. This is the same picture as painted by Jacques-Louis David in 1801. It's a revered piece of work of Napoleon crossing the Alps, a strongly idealized view of him leading his army through the Great St. Bernard Pass in May 1800. Napoleon liked the painting so much he made Mr. David do three more versions. The artist then did another one just because he could. It's how you got the message out before social media. Therefore, there are now five official versions. But could Bonaparte ever imagine another would now be hanging above the black sheets and pillowcases of chief boss commander. 
Would he have minded that it's not his face, yet it is his horse body and uniform, that the same dramatic clouds seem to push someone else up and over the path to victory? You never really know. Thank you. So there's the title and there is that refrain, you never really know, which you uh, add in several times and almost like punctuation or like a breathing um, space in the book. What, what? How did that come to you that you never really know? Um, from two places. The first is I love uh, an author called Kurt Vonnegut. And I remember reading a book many, many years ago, and I think it was And So It Goes, was his sort of you know, refrain, uh, ain't that so, ain't that life. And I think over the last um, few years, particularly in this context, you never really do know you, um, whether it's a political environment or, um, you know, COVID or whatever, there's such a, a greater sense of uncertainty in the world, um, fake news, uh, what is the truth? Where do we stand in terms of getting messages from uh, powerful people, uh, how much spin, how much truth. Now that's, I suppose, always been in the world since, you know, day one, but it seems to me as if there's a greater ambiguity uh, in the world today, and it felt this was an appropriate way of just, you know, pinging that um, as people read the story, just to kind of resonate with, I think, a, a kind of a greater truth. Mm, it does. It's very tempting as a reader to localize the book. You know, you think, you know, one finds oneself thinking of the compound as in Kanda or the Saxon Hotel. Um, we don't, you can't help but think about Jacob Zuma and his, what you, you call those eyes that move from side to side. But I don't think that was your intention. I mean, I think you've blurred the edges quite a lot. Yeah, definitely. It's, first of all, it's a novel, it's a story. Um, of course, it is set in, um, Africa, obviously. It's not meant to be cues or little wink, wink nudges. Um, it's really about this, this greater abuse of power. Um, again, going back to what is satire and what isn't, if I'd written a story about someone going to an embassy, um, their own embassy in another country, and they, you know, get chopped up yeah. and put into what you'd go, you know, steady on, John, you know, like, mm -hmm. It's a bit rich kind. So it's really, um, I know Africa, much more appropriate for me to write. And of course, the goings on of the last 10, 15 years all play a role, but it's not meant to be a snide, you, you get it, join this dot and you'll see something. It's, I think, you know, hopefully speaking from a, a slightly higher altitude. Mm -hmm. And John, why did you choose to tell the story in the first person? Yeah, I wrestled with that initially because, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit, um, you know, who is this? You know, it's kind of like God and I said. And But I thought Cappuccino was, was an interesting character and um, I wanted to create someone very naive but then very honest. And it felt that if you want to be that transparent about your character, then you didn't want someone else talking about him. You wanted him just tell you, and he's a guy who um, is trapped in this world. He, he goes to the internet um, to get facts, to, to try and understand life. And, you know, we know that's a, a precarious place to, you know, trust, you know, explicitly. Um, and that seemed to be better told straight. Boom, first person, here's what he's thinking, here's what he does, that's it. So there wasn't any um, third-person interpretation in it, if that makes so sense. He's, yes, it does. Um, it does. And I think it's absolutely the right way to do it. Um, wh was he always going to be a barista, uh, or did you think he would be something else at some stage? <laughs> um I thought originally there was a movie, and I think it was a book many uh, years ago, it was called um, Stalin's Projectionist. And it was the story of um, uh, a gentleman who was the projectionist to Stalin, saw all these horrible things, heard, overheard everything, and yet, you know, 
um, stayed in his little room with his two whirling reels. So that's where the original, original idea came. And I, I love coffee. And I thought, well, tricky these days to be a projectionist. Um, what's the modern version? And, uh, you know, Cappuccino kind of started as a name and then he became sort of his, the, the, the tonality of his skin. And then I thought, hey, it's, uh, it's barista time. So it really <laughs> came unevenly, to be honest. There's an awful lot of, of coffee law in this, which is, is quite useful. So Cappuccino is an orphan, um, and he's also something of an agoraphobic, if we can call him that. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I wanted to create uh, a, a character who was, sounds weird, um, pure in the sense of environment. He's never lived anywhere else, so he's not stained, if that's the right word, by uh, too many interactions outside the compound. And the fact that he um, was an orphan gave me a chance to play with the influences of the other individuals in the compound. So again, it was just kind of trying to create a, a character that was very, very um, rich, but sort of influenced in a, a very tight environment. Mm. And, of course, your love of words, you know, as a distinguished copywriter, your love of words um, comes out in the character of Cappuccino. Comedy is notoriously difficult to write. Uh, did you find that? Did you come up against any sp specific challenges? Not really, because I think if you can keep it in character, not just, the, not just Cappuccino and, and the folk around him, but the actual... Um, book itself you talked about um it's a bit of a shape shifter and it moves from being a, a romance to a something else to a something else but i think that the the tonal view that we follow cappuccino through those things stay the same so the humor if you like stays the same albeit sometimes dark sometimes you know him desperately trying to get tips on how to be a, a, a casanova um, <laughs> that level of humor stays the same, albeit that the context of the humor um, changes quite a lot. Mm. One of my favorite characters, John, is the, the Right Honorable Bishop Rolling Thunder, who's a very familiar character to us, isn't he? <laughs> so, um, direct story there. Um, our, our family was, were on holiday uh, in Kenton and we were standing at the PE, uh, in the PE airport and this gentleman appeared, who I immediately said to my wife, this guy is bad news. And he was clutching a Bible and he was wearing a bright purple outfit. And he had the psycho, you know, his congregation was saying goodbye to him. And they were literally, I mean, this guy was like the Messiah. And he looked mean and he was extraordinarily, um, you know, full of himself, and uh, and I watched him. We were on the same plane, and you know, he had his groupies, and he ended up being that um, minister of religion who was then had up for rape and all sorts of things. Uh, so he very easily morphed into um, the, the bishop, you know, the right reverend rolling thunder. Uh, but that that was the, the core of of um, that character, funnily enough. It was quite literal. But entertaining, but also, you know, like in much of the book, there's quite a dark undertone um, to the character. I, I would say that the, it's a book, um, the theme, the overriding theme of the book is power and powerlessness. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and I think how they, they connect um, in different environments the degree to which the the power is assumed and presumed and maybe asking the question on how much should the powerless accept themselves always being you know just just vulnerable is is that it is that the game um and the book maybe explores that tension yeah it does 
it's very it's so different um from your first two novels especially the last one the boy with a um with a swan in his head which we know is quite autobiographical i had a sense it, it i had a sense that that was a book you wanted to get over with that you wanted to get done with so that it would liberate you to go on to exploring different genres is that right um i'm not sure and you know i haven't really thought about it but probably so i mean now that you know, I pause. Um, I always wanted to write The Boy, and I was very happy I did. Um, but yes, probably it said, you know, tick, move on. Um, but I never, yeah, I, I think you're right. Although, to be honest, I never thought about it that way before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you influenced by other writers um, uh, when it came to, yeah, when it comes to satire, for example? Um, I'm, I'm sure I, I, I am, um, and particularly, as I mentioned before, I love Kurt Vonnegut um, mm -hmm. from the kind of like 60s, 70s, 80s um, writer. But I, it sounds everyone's saying it's sad. I did not set out to say this will be a satirical novel. Right. Yeah. Um, I, th I thought the world is is sometimes batshit crazy on steroids. Um, maybe there's room for a book that's somehow, particularly in an African context, reflects that. And sure. that then came about. Um, mm -hmm. So you just had to you just had to record it from yeah, the just, from the, the headlines. And did you write this during lockdown? No, it was written before lockdown, but lockdown supplied a very firm discipline with all the the editing mm -hmm. so um it was probably about seven eighths done before lockdown and then lockdown just do it you're in your house go finish this damn thing and mm -hmm. um there was the the one positive to um being a little bit like uh, cappuccino you know you, <laughs> You're isolated. You're stuck in one home, and uh, better do something worthwhile with that time. And how uh, how many drafts do you go through? Tell me about your writing process. <laughs> Perseverance. I mean, I wish I could sort of say something massively original, but every morning, sit down, drive my wife crazy because close the door with a cup of coffee, um, lots of drafts, um, mm -hmm. iterations that are so probably about four or five with this one, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of not all completely redone, but doing it again, and doing it again, and doing it again. Um, initially all in longhand, which is terribly archaic and wow. primitive, but I've tried other ways and that certainly for the first couple of drafts just feels more more natural to me so lots of paper and uh, writing pads all over the place and then persistence you know um, get up uh, at the same time and, and do it uh, otherwise I start wandering a little bit so I'm not good with breaks I don't write fast so I have to write often I suppose would be the methodology it's certainly it's something that um, that comes up again and again with the authors that I interview, and that is, it's you have to do the work, and there's no such thing as a muse that will come in um, through the window yeah. and visit you. You don't. You just have to do the work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot of romanticism behind that kind of, you know. I mean, I like wine, and I would love to sit with a bottle of wine and watch a sunset and have everything, you know, come to me. But certainly for me, it's, and, and often the, the story in the writing changes. So the muse is actually um, in the real here and now, as opposed to sitting on your, your shoulder, whispering things to you, for me. <laughs> well, someone who said you write drunk, but you edit sober. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you have to do. Um, I feel that I had, uh, you're so well known for your, for your work in the advertising industry, John. I mean, you really are one of the great ad men um, in South Africa. And 
and certainly your book, The Art of the Idea, um, continues to sell. It was a, certainly a book that um, was ahead of its time. And I've been wondering how what your take is on, on what has happened to us in the last year and um, how it's impacted the advertising industry and how you think it's impacting, if you can even imagine how it's impacting us, you know, as society. Mm -hmm. um, well, the first you know, observation is it's not even, um, and that's one of the, the bigger problems. So um, when I speak with our guys in, in China, a lot of them use the past tense about COVID, for example. They've had six months even of normal. Um, I got an email this afternoon from our friends in Finland. They're going down into a three-week hard lockdown. So you have this bumpiness, which is, um, I don't think the world has really ever gone through that. And what's that? That's producing um, the big undefinable. You, you can, to a large degree, quantify the pandemic. And to a large degree, you can quantify um, the sort of the financial cost. <clears throat> we had a, when I was working with the um, Solidarity Fund, the, the big question is the gray middle. Um, what is this doing to people's mental health? What is this doing to, you know, socializing, to, to how we go about our lives? And that's very random. That's very difficult to put a, you know, 10 steps to get you through COVID because it's lumpy and different people react differently. So I think you'll have at least another year or two before you even find what the new normal is. And that new normal will be very different in different categories. Um, you know, in the States and Europe now, often if you're being employed or you're going for an interview, you know, they you have a section of your salary or the company will give you an office at home. You know, they'll come in, they'll build you a little, here's your soundproofing. Um, imagine if we'd said that, you know, two, three years ago, it would be impossible. So. Mm -hmm. Work environment, uh, relationships, how people, you know, lots of uh, divorces, lots of babies, lots of you know, everything. Is, um, it's very, very difficult, except to say that hopefully the, the um, world will return to a kind of normalcy over time with the vaccine. And there is, that's the, the sort of, when you speak to people globally, that's the light at the end of the tunnel, whereas six mm. months ago, you didn't even have that. So I'm very optimistic, but it will be a lumpy exit, that's for sure. And, you lumpy. know, hold on to your hat, sailor. There's still, a, you know, many a twist and turn uh, along that route. I think you're that's right. It's a very simple answer, but I'm sorry, that's about the best I can do. No, 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 not at all. But um, you sort of wonder how it affects creativity. Uh, when, you're so, when one is so much in isolation. It's something that I noticed um, having not, I rather miss going into the newsroom, um, which I used to do every day. And I miss the colleagues and I miss the banter and I miss the gossip and I miss, I miss all that. Um, and if you have a, a feature meeting by Zoom, people tend not to, to throw ideas around because you're always speaking over some, do you know what I mean? You're speaking over yeah. somebody else. It, it has become too clumsy. And I think it surely does affect creativity. Um, perhaps in the ad industry too. Yeah, we, what we're seeing, and not just in the ad industry, but particularly in the ad industry, you can have greater efficiency in certain ways with Zoom and just connecting and, you know, you don't have to go into the office and a lot of the middlemen have been, um, or middle persons have been cut out because of the connectivity of uh, digital or internet or whatever. But if you don't have a strong culture, that's starting to really impact because people do need a moment in time to have a coffee with someone, chat about mm -hmm. ideas. Get, so many good ideas happen in the passage. And sure. you take the passageway away, mm -hmm. it's difficult. So you can adapt to a while. And my strong sense is there will be a maybe June, July, um, if there's not a very strong second wave, people will just want to be 
together again. There'll be one or two of those outliers who are happy to work quietly by themselves, fine. But by and large, we feeling oh, people are coming in now just because they want to come in. And that horrible drive to work is now actually quite a pleasant thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you feed your creativity in terms of what you read, uh, what you see, etc.? How do you feed your creativity? Um, kind of funny. I, I did a uh, interview with the One Club, which is still available online, uh, where they asked the same question, and it's quite interesting. The breaks down to two simple ones. First of all. Um, I love stories. I don't mean this, I love reading, but I love listening to people talk. I love if I'm on an airplane and you hear an interesting conversation or you chat to a mate. So I'm very charged by narration, by people telling me what's going on, little stories, big stories, jokes. Um, and on the other hand, um, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the video of the One Club, I keep a picture. Ah. <laughs> Next to me. So I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> uh, that is yes. to remind me to stay open minded. So that's think, think, uh -huh. think. And then don't just think, do. And um, that picture stays. As you can see, um, right, thanks next to you. and that's a per, it's a perpetual reminder to stay open-minded. The killer thing is when you start closing down your mind, uh, you get a bit ancient. Mm. You join a sort of mental country club. Um, be careful. Right. <laughs> I love that expression, a mental country club. I think we get lazy as well. Um, but tell us about your. Um, you were raised in Hillbrow, uh, and how did you get from there to where you are now? Um, so, technically, if you like, um, I wrote a story for, I think it was either Darling or Scope magazine, called 66 Ways to Make a Man Feel Grotty. Um, <laughs> so I was writing little stories, and um, my then girlfriend's wife was had new people in advertising and she said you know why don't you think about getting into advertising and i didn't even know that job really existed be a copywriter okay and i was amazed i actually paid you money to do that kind of stuff so no deep strategic thing um i never went to a university so i didn't have any you know fancy pantsy degree and um, I think, you know, again, luck or kismet, I don't know. Um, you write an article and someone gives it to someone and suddenly I'm in advertising, so. Uh, yeah, but you're um, one of the great um, in advertising. Uh, so you're lucky you fell into it so quickly. I was wondering, uh, Jane, whether there's any questions that might be coming in that we, uh, that we can order, but we can answer. Perhaps not. Let's go back to what feeds you, John, in terms of, of particular writers. Uh, the, do you read the, the read? What's next to your bed now? Um, funny enough, a book I've been meaning to read for a long, long time called uh, Half of a Yellow Sun. About uh, three quarters through. Yes. Uh, really, really um, enjoying that. Um, just finished The Milkman. Um, oh, the Anna Burns. Yes. Uh, mm. which I thought brilliant. Um, and I, I'm quite eclectic. So I I do not go to, well, I very rarely, unless I've had too much wine, I very rarely go to bed without reading. That's my kind of combination of calming my mind but stimulating it. So, mm. um, you, you know, I... Everyone is now lost in, in Netflix and Apple TV and Show Max. Uh, so that's my one sort of sacred time to read. And um, I find that 
really, uh, again, goes back to me, you know, stories. I love stories, any kind of story. Um, and that finds me um, naturally motivated. So I don't, I'm a bit spoiled in that sense. I don't have to work too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I like uh, beginnings, middles, and, and ends. And mm -hmm. I like, you know, fiddling men around. And that could be the next story. And do you regret that tsunami of content that we have available to us now, Netflix, et cetera? Uh, do you think that's having a profound effect on, on Absolutely. creativity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In one way, you can argue, you know, it's quite a, it's a cornucopia of everything. Um, but you just have to be careful that that doesn't, all this stuff doesn't chase you into opposite corners and cancel each other out. It can make you very lazy. You know, you can just click of a button and some of the, you know, some of the TV today is very, very good, but um, you you can know everything a little bit like cappuccino on the internet. You can, you can know everything but experience nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful that you can have such quick access to, I'm not a Luddite. I mean, I couldn't exist without, you know, my work, without the internet, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to keep checking with yourself. Are you just, are you filling your head with stuff that's relevant or are you just filling your head because you, you lazy and, you know, look, sometimes that's you know, it's a hard day, stick something on TV or, or whatever, but, um, be wary of knowing a lot of stuff, but not feeling particularly motivated by it. Mm. And also, week. yeah, and also just beware of that country club <laughs> that you warned yeah. us about. Um, Jen, I see that we do have some questions coming in. Um, Jennifer? Hi, yes. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, and a lot of comments saying they're really enjoying the conversation. So thank you very much for that. Um, let me just see what we have. Um, people are saying they really enjoyed the excerpt. Incredible writing, love that excerpt. But I'm just going to focus on the actual questions rather than the comments. Um, here we have one from, uh, let me see if it'll appear, yes. Margie or Margie, I'm not sure which, asks, hi, John, do you have a favorite character from your cast? Also, did you sample all the coffees? <laughs> so, um, do I have a very favorite character? Um, it's too easy to say uh, Cappuccino, because um, he's so central. I think the other guy would be Duku, the, um, the gentleman who, got to be careful of spoilers here, the probably Ru the, the Rwandan man who lives outside the compound. Um, I really, really like creating him because I went to Rwanda and I went, spent uh, some time there and uh, went to the uh, Genocide Museum. And he's kind of, you know, I thought, how, how do you make sense of this? How do you, it's just impossible. And in a way, um, Duku in the story allowed me to ventilate my head a bit. So you have to read the book for that comment to make sense probably. And then in terms of did I sample all the coffees? Uh, no, but I I got through a fair amount. And um, what is really interesting is um, the first I read about them and then it's a little bit, you know, once you once you've read about it, well then that's what it tastes like. Um, and I, I sampled one or two and then wrote about them and found out, taste white, I've got it completely wrong. <laughs> so I don't know what that says. COVID, maybe I've got, <laughs> I don't know. But um, I do love coffee and I do probably drink too much of it. Well, I must say our cupboard at home smells really amazing at the moment because when I got my, advanced, my reader's copy, Penguin sent along a couple of um, bags of 
coffee beans as well, which I haven't tried yet, but it's every time I open the cupboard, I get a delicious smell of, of coffee from, mm. <laughs> from the bag. So I'm looking forward to that. Just the smell, so a wonderful does you. surprise. <laughs> um, we have a question, another question from, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, but I'm guessing it's perhaps Zandria. Good evening, John. Do you find that you share any similarities in character or mannerisms with Cappuccino? If so, what would they be? People are clearly finding your characters very, um, very engaging and <laughs> interesting. Um, I, I, I think in the sense that um, I do tend to be more reserved. I do tend to uh, observe. Um, I think there's a lot of cappuccino in me in the sense that, um, especially when I was growing up, uh, I was very, very shy. I thought I was the um, sort of silent, interesting type, and I think I was just the invisible type. So <laughs> there was a, a lot of that uh, cappuccino uh, uh, in me, and I think there's a uh, cappuccino tends to think too much before he acts, and I might sometimes uh, overthink, not overanalyze in a technical sense, but, uh, you know, ruminate unnecessary instead of just get out there and do the damn thing. Well, tell us about Naomi, Naomi his love interest, time. John. Yeah, isn't she gorgeous? <laughs> um, Naomi. So I wanted to create a, uh, a woman who was attractive, um, but for for me sub subjectively, and we, you know, I I find the most attractive woman are the women who don't think they're attractive. If that makes sense, and they they just don't know um, how they, you know, everyone is kind of surreptitiously having, you know, wow, you know. Um, so I I liked Naomi because she uh, was real but not hopefully too kind of cardboard cut out um, in terms of womanly while she was also just doing her job, but quietly driving cappuccino crazy, uh, which I think is kind of like a nice tension when, you know, you don't know it, but, you know, steam is coming out of this guy's head and she's kind of, you know, morning, nice weather today, uh, which I think happens quite a lot in real life as well. It does. We've got quite a nice comment here from Anne, which is a comment, but I'll allow it because I feel like it's something we're all maybe struggling with at the moment. She says, John, after all your success, you still have such curiosity, which is rare. And I'm finding it quite difficult to find my curiosity. I'm finding it, I think that the, we're all sort of feeling a bit fatigued at the moment mentally. So perhaps you can share with us some tips on how to, or at least some advice on how, or you know, insight into how you keep your curiosity going um it sounds kind of a little counterintuitive but i think if you that picture the stay open-minded bit i think what happens a when times are tough b when you're tired you you kind of close down and that closing down narrows and narrows and narrows and narrows if you're aware of it you can you know lots of tricks um are you always listening to the same radio station? Are you going to exactly those same uh, web webinars where, you know, do something that, you know, you wouldn't normally think interests you and you might be surprised. Um, we all know the Facebooks, et cetera, et cetera. The, the more you follow something, the more they make you follow something. So you also end up in this rabbit hole of, uh, you think you're gaining a lot, but what you're actually doing is you're just compacting what you already know. Um, simple thing, the simplest thing for me, go and walk. Um, that's where you see all these wonderful things. Uh, half the, the things in the book um, are observed. I saw a wonderful thing the other day. There's a, uh, a dustbin on the corner uh, of uh, my street it's got a the advertising sign is find your greatness 
and there was a guy sticking his hand in, obviously looking for food. Uh, if you took a picture of that, you know, it's a wonderful, sad moment, mm -hmm. but there's um, this uh, Jim telling you to find your, your greatness on the side of a dustbin, and there's a man who's hungry with his hand in it. If I hadn't been walking the dogs, I wouldn't have seen the sign, I wouldn't have come back, I wouldn't have mused on it. So um, just physically getting out. Uh, if you go to the same coffee shop, go to a different coffee shop. If you listen to the same radio, yeah, just you, we get into habit and we think that's, you know, it's really just another excuse for, for laziness, but we call it habit. Mm. It's yes. such great advice. <laughs> Um, we have a question here. It's a two-parter from Alex. So I'll bring one up and then I'll bring the other up. Hi, John. In terms of your drafting process, would you say that you are always writing small, maybe sometimes independent skits or chapters that you one day bring together into a story? Or would you say that you first decide on a topic you want to write on and start all your exploration from there until you create a finished piece of writing? So he has a a very simple but might sound uh, Irish reply. So I definitely know the story arc and then as I write it that damn arc changes. So it's kind of strange. I know, so new for Cappuccino, it would be the story about power and the powerless. Um, lots of things happened in that story that I had no intention of writing and it just kind of happened in the writing so it's not compartmentalized at the beginning i might have a, a scribbly page or two where i have a you know one two three four um but i have a broad i do know the sort of the arc and then in the writing if if the arc is the north star then the writing itself becomes the gps if that's an intelligent way of putting it mm. There's a related question here books, from. John? Oh, sorry, Michelle. Sorry, um, I just wondered: Do you keep notebooks, you know, of things that you see and or ideas that might come in while you're drinking your wine, etc.? I do, I I do, um, and bazillions of these ridiculous stickies, which you know I have all over my desk here. Um, so. Yeah, you, you never know when that little thought becomes a sentence, the sentence becomes an idea, the idea becomes a chapter, the chapter becomes a book. Yeah, so I do. Also, I don't trust my memory anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, you, you do tend to forget those things anyway, like the stuff that you notice while you're out on a walk. Or um, you might think it's really sort of significant and funny or interesting, and then a couple of days later, it will be out of your head. So, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's, you asked me for my telephone number. I couldn't remember it. <laughs> well, now I have it. So. <laughs> it's in my phone. <laughs> um, Rachelo asks. <laughs> exactly. Rachelo asks. Um, she has another question, which I'm going to get to, um, which is why the question starts with also. But I'm going to get to that question a bit later. She asks, how do you decide what books you would like to write? Which I think is kind of related to what you were talking about now. Is it a similar process to copywriting where you explore a number of ideas or do you wait for inspiration to come to you? Um, so I have both with um, the space between and with uh, this book and with uh, the boy of the swan, I really felt that broadly I wanted to write it. So very different to say copyright. I don't worry about the target more. I don't know. Oh, well, because I want to write, it doesn't necessarily mean someone else wants to read it. So I don't do any um, marketing in my head. Oh, this could be interesting. Or this time has come for this kind of book. I feel inside. I really, really want to write this kind of story. Um, and I think it's very difficult if you over-process that because you might end up writing something well but it didn't mean anything to you uh, and I have a suspicion that the reader would see through that even if you've written it 
appropriately, maybe it doesn't have much soul. So I think if for me, broadly, yes, I want to write this. Now, exactly how that's where the process, if you like, comes in. So the inspiration is the need to write it more than a, a light bulb sort of going on because I, I've been so clever and I've thought of something that, that sort of makes sense. Mm. Mm. Another sort of semi-related question from Trent Seven, who says, um, how and, well, I think maybe it means how and why do your family, does your family impact your stories? Which is a sort of a um, question. My family is a great support. So uh, that's the first big thing. You know, you send up, um, there's a lot of time, uh, it's kind of lonely and um, it's really great to have uh, my family always supporting me. So from a, a process or getting through the day, definitely couldn't do it without uh, family support. I do watch my family, my friends, whatever, not in a, a literal sense, but uh, it's always interesting, you know, you, your kids keep you young um, and you learn Oh, you see a friend and you go, oh, he's got an interesting nose. I might borrow their nose or something like that. Um, but of course, never in a way that they would go, hey, you're using my nose. <laughs> but don't you, everyone, you just draw from everywhere. Yeah. So there's three questions here that are all related, and I'm going to read them out together. Pippa, who is actually my sister, says, um, I'm a big fan. I really enjoyed your book, The Art of an Idea. Pips in marketing as well. Um, she says, what books would you suggest to someone in advertising reads your top picks? So those are advertising recommendations. Then Katrina asks, hi, John. My daughter, Nina, age nine, asks, what is your favorite book? And Cajuelo again says, if you have any, what would your reading recommendations be for someone who's currently writing a book on a social issue? So uh, sort of like general wow. reading recommendation question there. <laughs> Those are all yeah. mean questions by this family. Um, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to say something terribly uh, wrong the first one. I don't read those books. Um, so, I terrible thing. I, I've never really read a sort of advertising marketing book. Um, so uh, I don't know what that makes me because I, I, I write one and then I don't, you know, so um, there are some, some very good books. Um, I, from a creative point of view, of course, there are many, many wonderful books. Be careful of too much received wisdom in the sense of you, you know, get out there and just just do it. Um, there's a one book that's very easy to read from a creative point of view. Um, it's not a, as good as you are, it's as good as you want to be. I would probably read that as a quick, you know, go get them uh, kind of book um, from a marketing point of view. Uh, what was the second question? Um, the second question was, what is your favorite uh, book? Very bored. <laughs> for a nine-year-old. Always a, a tough one because yeah, for a there were four books at different times. <laughs> um, but I'm going to be quite um, almost obvious here. As a teenager, I read Catcher in the Rye. And I have to say, it's the quintessential coming-of-age book. And everyone thought, oh, my God, he's not saying that one. I mean, that's an old chestnut. But to be honest, that really did. Um, I love that book, and I still love it. So if I had to choose one and be completely honest, that would be the book. I was going to ask if you've read it as an adult, because I think a lot of people say when you read it as a, a youngster and then you read it again as an adult, you have different reactions to that book, particularly. Exactly. That's what I say. It's a book books at different times yeah. um, and I was probably very vulnerable at, I don't know, 15 or whatever and I, I read that and I thought, whoa, you know, 
So, and that, that's the other thing, you know, some books date, some books don't, some books as you get older, um, you know, but I saw age nine, so I wanted Nina to know, that's, you know, otherwise we, you know, go, go read it, Nina, yeah. <laughs> there's some, there's some yeah. books that I'm too frightened to go back to. Um, for example, yeah. I, used to, I used to read Robinson, um, the Canadian guy. Listen, I've just forgot his name. Robinson, uh, Robertson Davies. Thank you. Robertson Davies, he's a superb writer. And he was, he was really the best. But I haven't read him for probably 10 or 15 years. And I'm almost too scared to go back to the, you know, what I thought of was a treasure. Yeah. And, and I think I that's valid. I think you're allowed to keep those goodies in your in your head. Keep them there. Keep that store of, of value um, for what it was at a time. That's a great thing with with the reading. It's you know the author does fifty percent, and then the reader does. You know, it's a it's a it's a contract. You take mm -hmm. out what you want, and if you're feeling vulnerable or it's a bit of the time. Terrific. You know, I don't think that's that's wrong. It's not like this is the best book ever and now that it's 30 years later, it's trash. You know, if it worked for you, then mm. hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Um, Rafaela uh, asks, mm. it's sort of, I'm not sure if you um, have any uh, advice um, for someone currently writing a book on a social issue, what they should be reading. You know, it's really tricky. Um, because I suppose it's, a, well, it's the definition of what the social issue would be. Um, and is it the context of sort of fiction or is it a story about a social issue? And if it's a story about a social issue, I can't think of, of a book immediately. I mean, there, there are lots of great books from, um, you know, what's the other, the chestnut everyone pulls out uh, to kill a mockingbird and all the, you know, what social issue when. But for me, the, the books that comment about social issues are the ones that the, their strategy isn't showing. In other words, it's not, I've written this book about a social issue, then people run for cover. I think it's much better if on social issues you, you pose the, um, the questions two thirds or, or the issues two thirds and the reader closes the loop. Mm. Otherwise um, it's, you, you kind of leading too much and people see you coming from a hundred yards. So any aspiring writers who are listening to this launch, you should definitely listen back to that last question and write that answer down because <laughs> that is some great advice for for writers it really and is. who are sort of and I'm, I, John, I'm interested in i'm interested in whether one would recommend non-fiction or fiction um for <clears throat> a social issue and i'm afraid i would i would go for fiction because i think that we learn the you know, greater truths told in fiction um than there are in non-fiction and i'm quickly going through my mind of local writers, I immediately thought of Rahana Rousseau and her yeah, books yeah. Set, um, set in Cape Town, set on the flats, um, and how much you learn of, of that environment, etc., from her fiction. I think there's such a greater, call it emotionality in fiction, that speaks truth both to power and to the issue, that a non-fiction, as well documented as neutral as they might be in putting their hypothesis it it can sometimes be a little bit you know difficult to get through and it serves of course a, you know a wonderful purpose i'm not saying non-fiction is trash but often if you want to i think engage social change you know i agree we go with the the fiction but um we're almost out of time but do you mind if we take one more question sure we have sure. we have a few more questions, but um, we're not going to have time to get all of them. Um, they've been sort of flowing in as we've been chatting. Um, but I quite like this one from Douglas. He asks, don't you wish with all the ironical politics during COVID that you could have included any of this craziness? <laughs> um, I think some of the craziness might be included um, in not the literal craziness, but it was kind of funny. Um, 
to be honest, the, when, when the book was nearly finished, just before COVID, there was this kind of, oh, I thought it was going to be out last year. You know, we could get it out last year. And then I worried that, you know, timing-wise, it was good that it wasn't February last year instead of February or, or March this year. And as the world got COVID crazy, generally crazy, I think the, the book, in a strange way, got more and more um, topical because mm. the world just did go, you know, batshit crazy in, in so many different ways. And um, I think the, the compacted craziness of COVID is a little bit demonstrated in Cappuccino, who's stuck in a house, who gets his news from the internet, who lives with a small band of people um, and who has to deal with the craziness of sometimes people in, in power who absolutely feel they don't have to be held accountable. Mm. Cool. Um, we have a couple more, but I'm going to let I'm going to advise everyone who has more questions to read the book to get inside the mind of the author, <laughs> and all your questions will be answered. <laughs> and Michelle, do you have any uh, final comments? Oh, just obviously to say I'm looking forward to the fourth book, and I hope that's well underway, John. <laughs> I have a, a few scribbles, um, so uh, no promises, but. Things are looking okay-ish so far. Good. All strength to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Very, Thank yeah. you, much appreciated. Thank you very much for joining us. And Michelle, thanks for those great questions. And it was a wonderful conversation. Um, thanks to Penguin Random House South Africa for helping us put this all together. And thank you very much to John for writing the book. Um, right. If you haven't bought yourself a copy, as I said at the beginning, it's available in all um, bookstores and online, and um, I really, really recommend it. So rush out and get yourself a copy tomorrow morning, or indeed buy one this evening online for delivery. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.